Welcome back to The Great Expanse by John Bat 426 here on YouTube. It is always a pleasure to record these videos, to edit them, put my unique spin on them for your viewing pleasure, for your listening pleasure. And let's not belabor the point. You know what the video is about. You click on the thumbnail. This is X-Men 97, Episode 8, Tolerance is Extinction Part 2. I literally just finished watching the episode. And let me tell y'all. The action in this episode, the comic book callbacks, were just so on point on this. All right, now, I'm, again, I literally just watched the episode, so I still got a million thoughts and a million feelings and emotions kind of intermingling. So I hope I don't get too tongue-tied. But this was an awesome episode. Let me let me just get it great right now. I'm going to give this an A right now. An A. Now, the episode begins... There's a there's a, a monologue, okay? Charles Xavier wakes up. He wakes up in his bed at the mansion. The mansion is in ruins because of the attack of the Prime Sentinels, okay? And Magneto blacking out the Earth's electromagnetic uh, spectrum briefly. Of course, that threw Charles Xavier's ship off course, and that's why he kind of crashed instead of landing, okay? So he wakes up in bed. You see him kind of angle his legs to get back in the old wheelchair because the yellow hover chair was destroyed. There's like a piece of like wreckage or debris like through it. So he goes to the door. The outer floor is like in ruins. So I was like, how'd he get there in the first place? But that, that's a wrong. Thing. Then we see Magneto. I thought he was at the mansion because he was at a cliffside. And there were all these like tanker ships. I mean, all these cargo ships in the ocean, out in the, in the water, wherever he was. And then all of a sudden he just uses well he's 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 debating in his mind because he has the helmet but since he knows that charles is back he needs the helmet now to block out charles's you know invasion of his thoughts and stuff so maybe he's just wrestling with the idea of confronting charles again or maybe he's just conf conflicted about his next plan of action okay so so there's a couple of things going on with magneto so magneto resolutely puts the helmet back on he like activates his powers you see like the waters become restless. You see this big piece of land come emerge, okay? And it's just awesome. Sorry about that. <laughs> but it's just an awesome display. It's awesome animation of the effects of his uh, magnetic powers. It's, it's, it's just so decent to me. We also see Bastion, and I don't know where he was, okay? But since Magneto shut down all the Prime Sentinels by, you know, distorting the electromagnetics, uh, the electromagnetic field, Again, I told you, I'm trying not to be tongue-tied because I have emotions roiling around inside of me. The entire town where his mother was staying, they're all, like, frozen. You know what I mean? Because, you know, the EMP shut them down. So he's carrying his mother. He has had tears falling down his eyes. So obviously he did care for this woman like his mother, even though I think they said he was a sentinel. I mean, great stuff, though, still. So we see that uh, Jubilee and Roberto Sunspot, who will eventually, I guess, be called. They're being chased by this mob, okay? And they had the Friends of Humanity, you know, mixed in, you know, I guess just to kind of solidify that MAGA, you know, Make America Great Again crowd, uh, I mean, extremist crowd. They backed them into an alley, and they both activate their powers, right? But then this a lightning bolt comes down. And up on the roof, overlooking the alley, is Storm and Forge. So Storm has heeded Charles Xavier's telepathic call. She went there to rescue Jubilee. Okay, and Roberto. Jubilee gives her a big old hug. He's like, you know, like, welcome back, big sister. Okay. So then we go back to the mansion, and Professor X and Scott Summers, they have this heated debate. And while I was watching it, when I was first watching it, I was like, don't, I'm like, maybe Scott is just overwhelmed with emotion. I said, but Professor X did what a father would do. A father always wants to make the world a better place for his children. So he said, I handed the school over to Magneto so that you guys could do exactly what Madeline Pryor, who we thought was Jean Grey, uh, assumed in the earlier episode, in the, I think the second episode or whatever. Mutant Liberation Begins. I couldn't remember it off the last video. That they could go out and live their own life and make their own choices. But Scott was like, you knew that this was always... If there was any conflict with Magneto or people like Bastion, it would bring me right back here. And Professor X was like, guess what? The conflict has brought me right back here from across the galaxy. 
He said, I'm right back here too. And he holds his hand out. And Scott like just walks past and just walks out. I was like, okay, I'll, 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 I'll dissect it from this angle. Scott Summers did not grow up with a father. He grew up in an orphanage that was secretly run by Mr. Sinister in the comic books. Okay. He did not know Corsair, who is his real life father, who's a part of the Star Jammers. All right. We saw them in the X-Men animated series, the original incarnation. He doesn't know how to be a father either. So he doesn't understand Professor X's rationale for this. And Professor X is telling him, like, yo, you and Gene were my first two students. You were teenagers. He said, you've always done what I asked. So basically, it's almost like Cyclops, you're, I don't want to say a slave, but you're a student of conflict. You will always go where the conflict is. It's almost like the conflict is commanding you where to be. And Professor X is like, look, I left, left Magneto in charge, so you two specifically. He didn't say the whole team. He said you and Gene could go off and live your own lives and make your own decisions. And Scott was like, I, again, that's just from my perspective. I'm like, Scott, you tripping. Professor X did what was right for you as a father. Because Professor X is basically the father, not biologically. But he's basically, he's been his caretaker, he's been his custodian since he was a young boy, teenager, okay? And he said that you guys, he said, Scott, you and Gene graduated years ago and you're still here. He said, I wanted you guys to go off and do your own thing. All right. So, I mean, again, I didn't understand Scott's like dispute. I mean, eh, I understand what Charles was trying to do. I mean, did he fail? Of course. All right. So then they're uh, Scott. They're making a battle plan. Okay. And Scott is saying, basically, we need to break the X-Men up into two teams. This is straight from the comic books, a blue team and a gold team. All right. So the X-Men that are there, he said, we're going to split this team. Half of us are going to look, track down Magneto and get him to turn the electromagnetic pulse, the electromagnetic spectrum back on because Magneto blacked out electricity around the planet. Okay. Which also goes back to the comic books. It's a comic book callback. All right. When Magneto returned. Now, Magneto had these epic returns in the comics. But this one, this was following the death of Colossus' sister. This is the comic book callback that I'm talking about right now. Following the death of Colossus' sister at her funeral. Like, all the X-Men and all the affiliated groups are there. Magneto comes down with this huge asteroid. It's not Asteroid M. What it was, was he took over Cable's old space station called Grey Malkin. We saw Grey Malkin in X-Men animated series. And uh, Beyond Good and Evil, that was his time machine. It was that huge, massive, like, space station that could travel through time. All right? So we saw it in the, the original series. So I don't know. Maybe Magneto got a hold of it again. But using she in the comic books, okay, this is a comic book callback, Magneto took over Grey Malkin, and he incorporated she technology from the X-Men when Magneto was left in charge of the X-Men, when Charles Xavier left the planet. So, so these are parallels that are running in this episode, okay? Magneto secretly co-opted Shi'ar technology from the X-Men when he was the headmaster in the comics, okay? So you see Magneto, almost like the funeral of Ilyana Rasputin, he comes down, he makes an offer to the X-Men, which is straight from the comic books. He says, this world is dead. Because Charles Xavier is saying, yo, man. He didn't say that. But he said, thousands of people have died and thousands more will die. And Magneto said, thousands died on Genosha. He said, whose death matters more? Okay. So Magneto, he, he's, he's so cunning. <laughs> like his, his form of extremism is, is just almost without parallel. All right. He's like, okay. He said, you're valuing these human lives. He said, but what about the mutant deaths? He said, the humans will always be a problem. Always. He said, I'm going to leave this world behind. I'm going to leave it blacked out. He said, he offered the, he gave the invitation. He offered the invitation to the X-Men. He said, come with me aboard. I think they called it Asteroid M in this, uh, in the, this episode, but it's really Avalon. He called it Avalon. He said, he said, we will rule on Asteroid M, leave this world to die with the rest of humanity. So he extends the offer and some faces are like, hmm, should we take him up on this offer? And Rogue takes Magneto up on his offer. 
and she was in the outfit from Uncanny uh, Avengers, which was uh, when the Avengers and the X-Men became like a, 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 a joint task force. They were called the Uncanny Avengers. Okay, she had the, the green with the white stripe. That That is a comic book callback, okay? All right. She joins him. And she said, when Magneto's going to put me as the queen of Genosha, she said, I did not want to see any more mutants die. She says, I'm going to reign with Magneto on Asteroid M. Okay. Then Roberto Sunspot does the same. He says, he said, my mother gave me up to the prime Sentinels in the previous episode. He said, I'm done with this planet. He said, I want to rule with Magneto. So Magneto said, when the sun sets tonight, that's the end of civilization. Now I need more explanation. Maybe somebody in the comment section can explain to me why particularly when the sun set on that evening with the electromagnetic spectrum gone or, or maybe i guess with no power the world would just go to chaos maybe that's maybe that's what it means okay like the purge almost it's like hey no security no electricity and everybody will just go bananas ah! okay so roberto and rogue join magneto and then asteroid m avalon ascends again okay and again, I, I can't help but bring up these comic book callbacks because Bo, bring back Bodemayo, bring back Bodemayo. Professor X has a telepathic communication with President Robert Kelly. And he talks about the Magneto protocols. Comic book callback. Again, this episode had so many comic book callbacks because there is the Magneto protocols in the comic books. And Professor Kelly, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, President Kelly. It's like Magneto is the greatest threat we've, we've ever faced. He said, we've got to enact these protocols. Now, in the comic books, it was like, a, a I think, a range of nuclear missiles. I think they had something in the in the, uh, the cone and the warhead so that Magneto couldn't disable them. Maybe. I'm just, I'm just thinking. Because even Nick Fury was a part of the Magneto protocols. And again, it's like a telepathic communication because you see like space. like, like it's, it's like a clock hanging on nothing. So that's for, to me, that's it. Okay, this is a telepathic communication. So then, the two teams separate, all right? The X-Men get into their old uniforms. Wolvie is in my favorite Wolverine uh, outfit, the uh, brown and the darker, the tan and brown. That's my favorite Wolverine outfit, okay? I know people like the yellow and uh, blue, but I was first introduced to Wolverine in that episode, that uh, co uh, costume. Sc Scott puts on the old Cyclops thing with the uh, sort of the fitting head headdress. Jean Grey gets into her Marvel Girl outfit. Scott gives Cable his 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 current costume, and Cable looks at it. And this is a callback to X Men, uh, two thousand, the first movie. He's like he's like, what is this? A clown outfit? And then Scott turned and said, "What were you expecting? Black leather?" So it was a it was a reverse because in uh, in X Men he's at the Wolverine. What were you expe expecting? Yellow spandex it was kind of a meta reference to Wolverine's uh, familiar outfit of yellow and blue. So I thought that was kind of charming okay so the two teams head off in different directions uh i don't remember the color team okay but the one team they go to bastion's island i i, I the base of op again i told you i just saw it they go to bastion's base of operations in the galapagos islands they see like there's a town there so he's trying to build like his utopia on the Galap galapagos islands and all these sentinels are activated. I was like, geez. And they said that Bastion is the server. Bastion himself is the one that can control all the prime sentinels and all the regular sentinels himself. Okay. So it's very powerful. They called him a technopath. Somebody that can commu commu uh, that can communicate tech, tech, who can communicate telepathically with technology. Professor X said that Cerebro detected this communication and he assumed Bastion was a mutant when he was a child. But as soon as his mother heard the word mutant, she closed the door on Professor X and said, get out of here. Okay, so he tried to in, in, uh, recruit Bastion into the X-Men as a young child, but he wasn't even a mutant. So they go to his island. They have to dodge all these sentinels. Storm is OP in this episode because Storm is a very powerful mutant. People just don't get it. Like Storm is almost Phoenix level powerful, except she uses nature. Okay. Uh, I'm going to briefly touch on this when she was kind of uh, incarcerated in a metabolic statue by Dr. Doom. Since she's claustrophobic, it was like a living hell for her because she was still conscious inside of the statue or whatever. So when she was released, she was like Storm Phoenix. Like she just had like her hair wasn't even hair. It was just like pure lightning. And, and Wolverine had to, of all people, Wolverine had to talk her down saying, remember what happened to your friend, sister, Jean Grey. 
And then Storm in this like OP Phoenix mode, she remembered because she was creating this storm that was going to wipe out North America. <laughs> like, like, I'm just trying to tell you. Storm is so powerful. I don't, I don't know if people get it or not. So she's creating like this huge F5 and taking out these Sentinels. Uh, Cable is like, no, 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 wrong, wrong. Cable is uh, a part of the team that's going to Asteroid M, Avalon. So they arrive, Magneto is expecting them. He's sitting on this like thrones, these like Sentinel heads <laughs> or whatever. So again, Professor X always wants to talk Magneto down. But Magneto said something, I don't remember exactly what he said. And Wolverine said, yes, we're skipping the banter. So we're going right to it. So they know Wolverine is gonna go for the killing strike, the killing blow on Magneto. They, they said that from the, from the early fight. So there's these two huge battles going on. Jean Grey is being engaged by Mr. Sinister himself. Okay. Um, oh, before they even get there, Morph morphs into the Incredible Hulk. Like, and he's just taking out Sentinels. And then he said, Morph smash. So like, it was it was pretty decent. It was a great visual to the real Hulk, not this guru nerd they got in the MCU you now. So again, action upon action, comic book callback upon comic book callback. Wolverine stabs Magneto through the side, okay? At first I thought it was through his, through his chest, through his heart, but it wasn't, it was through his side, it was through his ribs, okay? And then he, he gets the helmet off of Magneto. Now, Professor X was in the process of like, I think, I didn't know if he was gonna lobotomize Magneto like he did in the comic books, all right? And, and I hope I remember that point, okay? Because the lobotomy of Magneto creates something else, all right? So I think Scott, I think, did he shoot down Magneto or did he like shoot down the professor? Cause, cause it was interrupted by Scott Summers somehow. I don't remember. All right. But that gives Magneto the advantage and Magneto, he said, I thought <laughs> he like sent this magnet, this uh, piece of metal to cover up Charles's mouth or whatever. And he put his helmet on professor X, which I thought was pretty cool. Cause he can't, you know, penetrate the, the helmet psych psychically. He said, Charles, I've always wanted to say these two words to you. Shut up! Because <laughs> he said earlier in the episode when he extended the, the invitation to the X-Men, he said, your dream is dead. He said, look look what's become of it. He said, your dream is dead. So he's like, shut up, shut up. So then, again, Magneto, he goes right back to the comics. I hope you don't get tired of me saying comic book callbacks, all right? But he proceeds to rip the adamantium out of Wolverine's body, which happens in the comics. And the episode ends with the process of the adamantium being ripped out of his body. Now, they do something similar. Well, visually, they do something similar to that in the movie Days of Future Past, which came out in 2014. Where Magneto had all those, like, steel things, like, coming out of Wolverine. Like, like that was sort of a parallel to him removing his adamantium in the comic books. But, okay, so let me go back to Professor X lobotomizing Magneto. In the comics, the dark side of Charles Xavier... Okay, when it when it sort of like manifested when he like lobotomized Magneto, it created something called onslaught. Onslaught was a being created from the dark side of Professor X and the dark side of Magneto. It became its own consciousness because that's how powerful Charles Xavier's mind is. It created an unstoppable mutant psychic force called onslaught. Will they go there? Did Bo DeMaio have the cojones? To end this season with Onslaught. Wow. Mind blown. Will Wolverine die? Because, uh, spoiler for the comics, even though the comics have been out for 30 years. When Magneto rips the adamantium out of his body, Wolverine is on the brink of dying. Jean Grey saves Wolverine by, you know, invading his mind, you know, being, and, and trying to lull him back to the world of the living. Because Wolverine was ready to go. You know what I mean? So, and then after that, we get Bone Claw Wolverine. So, I'm trying to think. Are we going to go into season two with Bone Claw Wolverine and Onslaught? And I'm going to end the video right there before I just go off on all these tangents going on in my mind. Before I start theorizing like crazy. Go to the comment section. Talk about this episode. Please leave a dissertation if necessary. All right? David Brent style. You know where the comments go in the dissertations? Down there. That's where they go. Do your part. I'm going to do my part. So the Great Expanse by John Bat 426 Cannon will expand. It's in the name. Awesome episode. Awesome. Hey, quick 
quick note, um, in addition to this video, there will be a companion video because of all the comic book callbacks that were in Tolerance's Extinction Part 2. I want you guys to get a grasp of a lot of the stories, a lot of the material that Bo DeMaio and the rest of the team glean from to put together this stellar episode, the penultimate episode, okay? Episode 9, episode 10 will be the end of the season, and I'm sorry to see it go. I wish I had more episodes. But yeah, I just want to give you guys just a sneak peek of everything that went into this episode. So you'll hear a little bit of my voiceover, so it won't be my typical video where I'm just here talking. But you'll actually get to see from the comic books where they could have gone and where they actually went. And episode set, episode eight, Tolerance is Extinction Part One, there was a, a blunder on my part, I apologize. When I uploaded it, I accidentally deleted half of it. So I will have to remix that, uh, Put my unique spin on it again you know have to be uh, uploaded and uh, available for you guys at a later date but it will be coming i have not forgotten and i appreciate all of you that helped to make the great expanse by john 426 to expand and to grow by word of mouth by comments by likes whatever you guys are doing please continue and please help to continue to support the great expanse by john 426 here on youtube i appreciate all of you